The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. As I just stated, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, converting an HTML file to a Drupal theme. This is an introductory class, largely, um, or session class, whatever you want to call it. I'm really going to be starting from the, the bare bones basics of theming Drupal. Um, really going to be starting from scratch. So if you know a little bit already, um, you might be a little bit bored. But I really wanted to start really at the foundation of you know even where the theme lives and all that. And I will say that I'm taking a risk today in the fact that um, pretty much all the code that I'm going to be showing you, I'm going to be writing live um, because I feel you learn so much more. I've done presentations in the past where I just you know, show you slide decks and screenshots of code and stuff like that. But I feel like I learned so much more by actually seeing someone do it in an editor, going into the interface, turning stuff on. So. Um, that's the way I decided to do it today. So if something blows up, um, beyond my control. Um, one quick thing to note is, uh, aside from the code that I'll be writing, um, there's a few places where I just made git branches um, to basically section off different places in my code. I can't talk about git today, but I basically did that as a quick way to like jump forward and not have to you know, remember a few, a few things. Um, uh, my name is Thomas Lattimore. I'm a front-end developer for Classic Graphics. Uh, we're a company based here in Charlotte. Uh, do a wide variety of things. Really, it's hard to explain what we do, but the easiest way to narrow it down is we manage large sets of data and uh, do things with that. And that's what we use Drupal for. Drupal is our primary platform for content management on the website of things. Um, we've been using it since about four, five, four, six, I believe. So we were actually a pretty early adopter for the size sites we were building at the time. Um, and I live and breathe in the theme layer of Drupal pretty much when you narrow it down. Uh, if you have any questions later on, you can stalk me on Twitter at tlattimore. And uh, there's my drupal.org user profile if you want to follow any of the projects uh, that I contribute to. I, I try and really contribute back to Drupal.org. So there's some themes there and other projects that I'm involved in. And if you want to find out about the company that I work for, it's knowclassic.com. That is noclassic.com. Uh, let's get started. Oh, so today, um, our, uh, well, step back. Uh, so the requirements to get started in a theme, the very first thing that you have to have is a .info file. And the .info file lives in your theme directory, and it's prefixed by the name of your theme. So it's, if, your name, if your theme name was foo theme, then it'd be foo.info. And that is technically all that is required to start with a theme. But the theme doesn't actually have any use because if you don't add CSS to that, then you basically just have an, an unstyled theme that doesn't do any good at all. And that's just, so the theme inf info file is just meta information. It basically tells Drupal about your theme, um, what style sheets are included with it, what JavaScript files are there, how many regions you have, whatnot. Um, technically all you need. And then really to make it any use, you have to have a CSS file. And, uh, Kind of the assumptions I'm making today is that, of course, you have a text editor, working Drupal install, and then I'm actually going to be using Devel module, which if you're a developer, I highly recommend uh, you have that module installed. It's very useful for different utilities, and I'll uh, demo that later, kind of how I'm using it. And then also a basic understanding of HTML, CSS, and PHP. Um, you don't have to have a lot of, you know, a, a wide range knowledge of PHP to really get started in Drupal theming. Um, but I recommend that you at least learn the basics of it so that when you're tinkering around in the theme layer, um, for one thing, you don't do things that are bad. But then also, it's, it's just less intimidating when you are comfortable writing the language. And uh, that's it. 
let's get started. So who here has um, made a custom theme in Drupal before? Can I see a show of hands? Who's written a custom theme from bare bones? Finished it. Yes, <laughs> finished it, <laughs> finished it. Production, let's even say that. You wrote one that went in production. All right, this is a great crowd then. Who here has downloaded one off of Drupal.org and installed it? All right, more hands, more hands. See classic people back there? Why y'all so far away? Yeah, way back there. All right, so I basically just have a, um, a Drupal site that just now exploded with a bunch of errors because of a problem I didn't fix earlier. But it's just basically a naked um, Drupal install. Um, and we're actually going to set Bardic to default, or else those errors won't go away. Um, can everybody see that OK? Do I need to zoom in much? Just a little bit? OK. I was doing something at a Drupal user group earlier this week, and they were like, oh, I can't see it. And I'd already gotten like several minutes into the talk. So everybody see that good? Kind of see the interface buttons along the top. So you all know what I'm clicking on. Are we good? OK. Um, so here we have just a basic Drupal 7 install. Um, I hope everybody in here is familiar with that. If not, there's lots of online documentation on how to get started, get that thing installed. And um, that's basically the point that we're starting from today. And um, I'm, I'm kind of a command line junkie, so if you see me pop in and out of the command line and, and you don't know what I'm doing, just kind of ignore it, because it's most likely that I'm doing um, Git-related stuff. Um, so here we basically have the HTML file that we're going to be converting today. Um, it's nothing, nothing good to look at by any means. I just threw it together. Um, as I was making this presentation, because I wanted the focus to be more on just clean HTML and not really um, what the content was or anything like that, but just show you the process of converting you know, this into a working Drupal theme. Um, so I'm actually going to open up, uh, what directory is that? I'm going to go one lower. So here, is our Drupal install, basically. Here's where the modules folder is. This is the root of this site right here. Oh. Um, and any theme that we customize or download off of Drupal.org needs to live inside the sites all themes folder. And the only exception to that is when you do a multi-site install, then if you have a custom theme for that site, then you'll, uh, the theme will reside inside the directory for that site. Um, if you're not familiar with multi-site, don't worry about it, because um, it doesn't matter. Anything that you need to do um, custom or even contributed needs to, go, needs to live inside this themes folder here. And the reason is, is because when you update Drupal, it blows away all the files that live outside of this sites folder. Literally, it, it just writes over them when you update to a new version. So anything you customize would be blown away. If you, uh, you can drop it in here, in, inside the themes folder down here. It'll actually work fine. But the next time you go to update, it's gone. All your work will be gone. And you hope that you have it under version control. You use version control very heavily. Um, so right here is, is our um, HTML file that we have. Nothing special there. Um, I already showed it to you. And the first thing that we need to do is we, ooh, I'm going to tip that over, is we actually need to write that .info file, that meta information I told you about earlier. And I'm actually just going to check out that step. Ignore this if you don't understand Git. And here's our project inside Sublime. And you'll see that I just checked out Git and ignore that. But just act like I just wrote this. And here's basically all the information that we really need to get started custom theming. And I really do mean all the information. Because um, uh, we can, Drupal has an inheritance system where 
if you don't declare a template file in the theme, it inherits the core one. And it, inherit, it, her, inherit, it, it inherits it from the modules uh, system folder or whatever module the template is related to. Does that make sense? Do I need to clarify that? So basically, if I don't put a page.tpl.php file in my theme, then it is going to inherit this one right here from the modules system page.tpl file. Does that make sense? It has this whole inheritance system. So it makes it so you can really customize a lot and inherit stuff from core, which really um, sets it aside from lots of other systems like and uh, I'm not going to hate on WordPress because I haven't worked with it in several years, but it used to be you had to have several files really to get going theming WordPress. There had to be several files in place there. So to get started, we are going to just go and rename our index.html file simply to page.tpl.php and use PHP, renamed. Going to go and open it up here. And the first thing that we want to do, if, if you're literally following this process, now every design team or you might find your own process, but if you're literally taking an HTML file from, um, you know, its, its static state into a Drupal theme, then the first thing you need to do is delete the everything from the body up, and then also the closing HTML and body tag. Because um, Drupal by default has an html.tpl.php file that covers all this stuff. And if we don't declare that file name in our theme, then it's going to inherit that one. And this is where you start getting into the Drupal side of things. So, Basically, our page.tpl file is going to be put in this area right here. Everything else is going to inherit. So all the style sheets are going to be printed out there. All the scripts are going to be printed out there and body classes and all that. Does that make sense? Any questions? Feel free to ask any questions, by the way. I, um, I don't mind interactivity and stuff during you know, sessions. I feel that we learn a whole lot more that way. Um, so the first thing that we need to do, uh, and I actually want to close that out because I was editing the wrong file. So one of the, as I already said, we want to delete those tags and then save it. And then the next thing we want to do is actually um, tell Drupal where um, the messages area is. And uh, we're going to do that by uh, we want to print it out in the main content. And the messages area is just a place that Drupal has to print out arbitrary messages to send to the user. So if you ever have saved a node and it said, this node 32 or whatever the title was was saved here, that's printed out in the messages area. And we're going to use this basically to um, help to send uh, variables to that we can print out. And I'll, I'll show that to you here in a second. And um, after we do that, we can go over to the appearance section. And we will see our theme there. Um, no screenshot, simply because I didn't add one in there. Um, we're going to enable and set it to default and go home and hope nothing blew up. And you'll see now we technically have a working um, theme. Um, all the static, all the content in there is static, but it's using our page.tpl file to, um, you know, basically wrap the page. We're not sending any content to it yet, but it's technically, you know, working. Um, we're 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 making magic happen here. Man, that looks funky on that screen. Can you do that step one more time? Right, go back to. Okay, go back to appearance. Yeah. Or so simply to enable a theme in Drupal, you go to the appearance section, and then 
there's an enable and set to default. And then before that, we had our HTML file here. We renamed it to page.tpl.php, and we're now inheriting that file as basically the wrapper for our theme. Is that good? All right. Um, and then, if that message is area, message is plural because um, there can be more than one message displayed at a time. Um, Drupal is really bad at uh, um, using singular or plural in different places, I think. Like, there, yeah. yes, me and, me and Steve argue about this all the time. Uh, like style sheets in the .info file. Um, I guess I should probably have hit on that, that more, but basically there's a documentation page on Drupal.org that explains what needs to go in there. Um, if you just search uh, its anatomy of .info file, then it'll tell you what to go in there. But it uses the plural term even though you're only declaring one style sheet after it. it really annoys me. Um, anyways, moving on, end rant. Um, so we have um, that devel module I mentioned earlier. Go over to configuration. The devel module comes with, uh, after you enable it, and again, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that you have a working Drupal install and know where to drop modules and how to enable them. And if not, I'll be glad to point you to some resources after the session. Um, but I just have a limited amount of time today, so um, uh, can't, can't cover all of that. But this has a um, wide array of things it can do. There's a content generation module that's built in that can generate dummy content for a site. And I'm actually going to use the re rebuild theme registry on every page. Drupal loves to cache things. And what this basically does is during our theme development process, it says, all right, Drupal, don't ho hold on to the files that I'm messing with. But you need to make sure that you f first disable that setting, but also disable this module when, it, when your site goes into production because it's a big performance hitter and also a security risk because it has an execute PHP block built in. For those of you that know what that means, that basically means that there's a block on the site that you could execute PHP in and completely ruin the site, like totally ruin it. You could uh, you know, insert an SQL query and just ob obliterate it in whatever way you chose. So we're using that setting and then also, um, this module has some utility functions built in. Um, and one that I find myself using very heavily is, is DSM. And it stands for Drupal Set Message. Um, and it basically sends a, um, if any of you guys are PHP people in the room, um, if you're familiar with print R, which basically prints a readable version of a big array, um, and it sends that readable version to the messages variable down here and displays it in a nice collapsible way if everything works right. And there's some other ways to do that. Um, I like to do it with big arrays like this. The page array is very, very large. Um, there's other utility functions that it also comes with that can do some other things. Steve likes to do just, just print R stuff, which, which works great. Um, so we're going to refresh the page and hope that it's sent to messages. Tick tock, tick tock, didn't do it. Okay, and I'm gonna explain why it didn't do it. Um, because of the way the theme layer is executed in Drupal's bootstrap process, which is basically the process that calls all the different places, like what content to render and how to render it and all that stuff. Um, if you send a message to Drupal's message area, um, uh, in the theme layer, it's basically sending it after the content is rendered. So this is basically a message from our previous page refresh. Um, that's important to note because in de debugging, you, if you're sending messages to that area, um, you're actually seeing what was on the previous page refresh. So if you change what message you send, you can get an incorrect value there. Um, so we now have this big array of stuff. And this is basically all the content that is available to our page.tpl.php file. 
And the first thing that we want to do is actually go and render um, uh, the main content. And that uh, variable is just called content. And then also, um, these values here are actually uh, each region that's declared. And we're inheriting those from Drupal core because we did not declare separate regions in our uh, info file. That makes sense? OK, moving forward. Um, so now that we know what variable we need to, rent, uh, to print out, we can delete that dummy content there. And the syntax for this is print render. And render is a built-in Drupal function. Um, and then the argument that goes into render is the name of the region. I'm going to save. And you'll see all that's gone. And we should be, why is it not showing up? Oops. Nope, that's right, I think. Maybe it's, it should be correct. Exactly why you shouldn't do live demos during presentations. Oh, because uh, content isn't rendered for some reason. One of Drupal's inconsistencies. And it's still not coming up. Not sure why. Not sure why. But basically the process is that. So you get the variables that you need to be printed out. You get them out of this array here and print them where they need to go. Um, and let's go ahead and print our title because content's not working for some reason. It should by default have a, um, you have added no content to this site yet out of Drupal. Um, I think that's right, print title. Undefined variable. So when you run into problems like this, the best thing to do is go into system, um, folder, and actually open up the page.tpl file. And then look and see what variables. Oh, that's why. Because first you have to call. So sorry, getting ahead of myself. Um, so we were trying to render just content. And we actually need to first call the page array. And then the content uh, key out of that array. I'm trying to use proper terms here. Steve will fuss at me if I don't. So we're going to do render, inside render, page, inside page, and it's telling me I have an error. And there's our content. So now we have a working site title, main content. And then we're actually going to wrap our site title, because before we had our site title wrapped in an H2. And then we can go up here and delete all the content from in the sidebar. Um, let's make that sidebar first. Closing PHP tag, refresh. And there we have it, sidebar content rendered. And just to reiterate, this right here is this. Does everyone get that? I don't want that to go over anyone's heads, because that's basically it's an array of data. And we're looking for certain values in it which is that argument. Is, is everyone understanding that? Because I know that's kind of a 
Go ahead. That's a great question. That is because um, Drupal is schizophrenic. Um, I, I'm in all honesty. And uh, 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 Ken mentioned earlier the Twig initiative, uh, basically trying to get the Twig templating system into core. This is part of the reason that people are doing it, is because themers, when we got this render stuff in Drupal 7, let me tell you, Drupal 6, it was a lot, lot rougher. Ren having render available is really nice. But a few years down the road, we're like, this is terrible because there's so much inconsistency, just as you asked. So basically, you have to work around and yeah, you have to go to you know, system page.tpl and figure out you know, what needs to be rendered out of there. So next, uh, let's go and um, since I'm in page.tpl, I'll just copy it out of here. Um, let's get rid of our static menu now. Go back into our custom page.tpl.php file. Delete that entire unordered list. And we have this other very inconsistent array. Why don't we just print out main menu? No. We have to have this big array, which is theme links, System main menu. Me and Steve argue about this all the time. We're like, what? Why, why can't it just stay consistent? Um, it's just because different pieces got updated, and now they're just saying, screw it. Screw PHP template, which is our current templating system. Let's bail on it and use Twig and make everything consistent. So great question. Um, refresh that. Is there a way to inconsistently implement Twig? Uh, yes, there is. <laughs> there totally is. But now we actually got rid of our um, static menu, and you'll see that it's actually, for some reason, they, they thought it'd be a good idea to put a, a title over the menu in. Um, uh, nope. So our title's showing up there, and I don't want it to. That beef. And that might actually cause a syntax error, maybe. Um, but that's basically the process. We're starting to run out of time here. I think I only have till 10. Um, uh, basically, the process is you, that, that I encourage using is get a hold of that page array, see what values are in it, start replacing the values that are in your HTML file with those values. Um, I hope this is helpful for you. Sorry about the hiccups in a few places. You have to 11, 15, so you have oh, I have still 11.15. Yes. Um, the thing I encourage, and it's the thing I actually do for a menu, is go into, so in our Drupal site folder, which is this, this is the root of our Drupal site, you go to modules, system, page.tpl, and then find the, that main menu line in there. And it's a big array, and we can actually pull out some of that. Um, we don't need the class stuff on there. Um, that's actually one of my biggest frustrations um, as far as inconsistency goes. And then like another one is like site title for some reason isn't sent through render. Oops, caps lock. Site title. And this is gonna replace it with the name of the site which is like Drupal Camp Charlotte. and it didn't for some reason. Let's see what undefined variable we have. Site title. Why didn't that work? Hmm. Again, check the documentation, which is the file. Triple Camp Charlotte. No, that was supposed to be in the H1 site name. So another place where things get confusing. Site title is what Steve just mentioned, what goes up in the header bar, and then site name is what is, you know, your, basically your page title. Can you tell me one more time where you're getting that? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, so you go into 
the site root, wherever your, your site lives, and then you go into modules, system, page.tpl.php. And that basically is, is a good place for, you know, documentation on that whole, that whole file that we were just working in. Um, also inside the node um, directory under modules is also the node.tpl, which is probably something you'll have to get into um, doing custom theming a lot. Um, any questions at this point? So we got plenty of time. Plenty of time. I could just stand up here the next half hour and make y'all wait. Yes. Well, basically, all I did um, was you just, if you have an HTML file, just a static HTML file, that's it. You rename that file to page.tpl.php, which is essentially it's the wrapper for um, everything inside here. Everything that's visible, page.tpl wraps it up in, in, in essence. Um, uh, so after you rename that file, then you remove the, basically all the header information, the site title, style sheets, and all that, because Drupal handles that for you inside of another file. And then you're closing a body tag, body and HTML tag. Um, and then you just start putting PHP in there. And just by that file name, Drupal recognizes that, hey, th hey, this theme is enabled, is there, any files that match this particular name in there, and if so, use them, in essence. Um, any other questions? Good, good question, by the way. The CSS file that you built here basically came off of that lives in your site. Also. Yes. So um, everything that we ever, ever touch needs to always live inside the sites all themes folder. So right here, here's our two CSS files, one layout, one style.css. And that is declared um, in our uh, .info file, um, which is an another part of, if you weren't at the beginning of the session, in order to tell Drupal about your theme period, you have to have a .info file, which is just prefixed by the name of your theme or the machine name of your theme. Um, and that basically is just a file that tells Drupal um, all about different attributes of your theme. Uh, there's a, lots of stuff that can go in there. Where is the Say, uh, in the sites all themes folder, inside your, your custom theme folder, that is. Um, and any, uh, um, say if we had a scripts file, yes, plural. Um, don't know why it's plural, but. Uh, I don't know that I look at it. It's not a key value pair, is it? Yeah, you're right. But if you're only declaring one item, we'll argue about that another day, Steve. Um, so whatever, whenever you're linking to files in your .info files, though it, whether it's scripts or style sheets, um, the path is relative to your info file. So Drupal won't automatically, you know, say, if, you just, if I just had layout.css in here, it won't search that theme folder automatically and find it. You actually have to list the path to it. Important thing to note. Um, any other questions? I feel like we're in a QA session now. I've got lots of time left. Go ahead. Are instead of going from a static HTML, from, if you're starting from a downloaded theme and customizing it, what are some of the gotchas to watch out for? Do a base thing, first off. So if I, um, uh, we can actually do that. 
because uh, I actually have a theme. So, um, and I forgot to download it here. I won't go into that now. I thought I had an extra one downloaded in this directory. Um, so, important thing to note, um, especially if you're new to theming, uh, hide, um, is that whenever you download a theme from Drupal.org, um, I have people argue with me over this. They're like, well, you don't really need to, but whenever you download a theme from Drupal.org, always, always, always make a base theme of that. And um, basically, in short, um, now there's lots of areas that this doesn't actually play out, but basically, to make a base theme of another theme, you just put that attribute in your .info file. So if the theme lists in your site, lives in your site's all themes folder, then I could make a base theme of it um, called foo theme if I wanted to. Um, or uh, that would be my parent theme, excuse me. And the reason why you want to actually do that, um, so question is, you know, you download a theme from Drupal.org, it's awesome, but there's a few things that you want to change about it. You could go hacking away at that and just open up the theme folder and, you know, edit what styles you don't like and change the layout of the page. But if it's a well-maintained theme, then that means Eventually, it's going to get upgrades, which means that you will lose all your changes. It gets back to the same thing with updating Drupal Core. Don't hack Drupal Core because when it gets updated, you lose all your changes. So, Drupal has this really cool theme called uh, really cool theme called um, being able to sub theme. And what a sub theme basically does it is allow allows you to inherit um, nearly all attributes of the parent theme. Um, that includes style sheets, um, regions, template files, JavaScript, excuse me. And the exceptions to that are there's a few places where it won't inherit some custom uh, PHP functions that live in template.php because uh, of the way Drupal's hook system works. Um, does that answer your question or was that just like a whole rabbit trail that I... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you download a theme from Drupal.org, don't hack it. Um, uh, uh, make a sub theme simply, basically, and there's a doc on, on Drupal.org about this, but basically, in short, it's you just declare in your custom theme that you want to have a base theme of whatever your parent theme is. And you get to inherit like, all the, if you're familiar kind of a little bit with themes in Drupal like Omega and uh, Fusion and Zen and all that, the reason they exist and can live on as projects is because we have this base theme functionality that people can extend this huge library of nice CSS and uh, great layout techniques and stuff like that without actually having to change the files and then figure out what we're going to do when the theme gets updated. So that's a really powerful thing. I almost always sub theme. I rarely ever just create a straight out theme. Generally, I'm, a, I'm set, uh, creating a base theme. I mean, a sub theme. Any other questions? Any other questions? I have a free book if someone wants to ask a question. Free book, any questions? What? Someone asked the question, you're going to give a book? Yes. What's your favorite color? <laughs> 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 I think on his name, I'd say gray. <laughs> um, my favorite color is blue, but that doesn't count, Hannah. <laughs> Basically overriding it, yeah. in essence. And that also works because of, I don't want to get too detailed into this, because of the way CSS cascading works, because uh, files that are declared after 
the previous ones in CSS can override attributes. So say if there's like a color or something like that in a theme that you want to override, you can override that, you know, the color on that element um, later on in the cascade by doing child theming. Does that make sense or did that go? <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to get, like, how do you pick? Like, so it's like You've asked some good questions. Here's a free book. <laughs> um, so you can keep going if you want. I didn't mean to, like, you know, stop your question, but you've asked some good questions. Uh, sorry, Hannah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, you're, yes, you're overriding stuff. So say there's a, there's a layout that you want to alter. Um, and or or any attributes in the page.tpl file of your parent theme. All you have to do is place the, your customized one in your child theme, and it'll override it. It just knows to. The only again, there's a few exceptions to that, and it seems like they've improved it a little bit in Drupal 7 because I haven't run into it as much, where um, custom functions that are declared um, aren't inherited, and again, that has to do with the way Drupal's hook system works and whether or not those functions are executed. So, so. I think we're done, unless there's any more questions. Um, go ahead. Quickly, what, what would be one or two recommended resources for Drupal.org? Um, Drupal.org, if you don't have a Drupal.org user account, go create one now, now, now. Go do it now. Um, Drupal.org uh, Mustard Seed Media Podcast actually has a really good screencast on doing exactly what I did today, but it's in Drupal 6. But the principles still apply. Um, if you uh, think back on today and are like, man, I don't know what that guy was talking about. I think it's a cool concept. I just don't know. Uh, check out Mustard Seed Media's podcast, and he basically walks through in like 10 minutes, you know, what I just took. 45 minutes of y'all's time to talk about. Uh, just basically walks through, you know. He just goes and downloads an HTML file off the internet and turns it into a Drupal theme, so. Yes. Uh, it's mustardseedmedia.com, I believe. And he has actually some great podcasts on many different topics regarding Drupal. Uh, great guy, it's, it's uh, his name is Bob Christensen, um, and he's been doing Drupal screencasts for years now. Doesn't do them as much anymore, unfortunately. But yeah, that's a great resource, Drupal.org, and um, then it really starts to dry up after that. I say revert to Drupal, I mean revert to Google um, about your problem, because Drupal.org's documentation really could use some improvement. And if you want to improve it, join the documentation team. So, well, thanks a lot for coming, and I uh, hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me after the session or hit me up on Twitter as T. Lattimore. Afterwards, um, next session coming up is Brent Dunn. He's going to be walking through some amazing site building stuff. Um, he's going to show tons of just jam packed stuff in his session. Uh, he's told me a lot about it, and it sounds really good. So, yeah. If you're interested in site building stuff or you're new to Drupal, that would be one to attend. Another one I encourage people that are new to Drupal is uh, uh, David Norman's one at, I believe, 1.30. Um, and I think he calls it the Drupal co-op or something like that. But it's basically all about how the Drupal community functions and how you can get involved. And this guy. Uh, is more qualified to talk on that topic than most people in the world. Um, his Drupal.org user ID is longer than most everybody in this room's combined. That may be a bit of a stretch, but I encourage new people to definitely check out that session and then the one right after me with Brent. Thanks a lot. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. 
the, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a I think that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones 
that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.